Oh, 
who may dwell in your sacred tent, who may live on your holy mountain. The one who walks is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others, who despises a vow man but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we come this morning thanking you for your many blessings. Thank you for allowing us to come out to worship you in spirit and truth. Father God, we ask that you be with us today as we worship you. Let us be with you as we go about this day. And Father God, we ask that you be with our pastor as you he brings the word that you have given him to feed your people. We, we thank you for your grace and we thank you for your mercy. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We know he's a great God. He deserves all the praise. is super easy. Y'all can sing it from you from your seat if you believe it. If y'all believe that he deserves all the praise. I know I'm not by myself. He's been too good. Hallelujah. 
that I have it belongs to you you deserve it you deserve it oh oh, oh. oh. come on pastor get a little bit
they can be ministered to on their level, grades or ages zero to fifth grade, those middle schoolers who are tasked to assist. Let's praise God for our children and those who are serving our children. Let's praise God again for those who have led us in worship through the ministry of music. Ain't it good that God can hear our O's? like we still have the thermostat on fall months and it feels like summer in here if, if we maybe can one of the brothers can check and see what we have going on uh, is that all right with you all you all kind of warm as well praise God all right <laughs> aren't you glad you came to worship today. I want to thank those who are visiting with us today. Uh, those of you who uh, are family, I, uh, I'm just glad to see your faces today. Will you breathe the word of prayer for me as I pray for you and pray for the preaching moment. Father God, we thank you for this time. I approach you at this moment because I need your help. God, move me out of the way <clears throat> because the people came declaring, sir, we wish to see Jesus. So God, we're asking that you would speak through me about yourself. God, we pray for listening ears and open hearts so that as we hear your word proclaimed, that we not only walk away from this place hearers, but doers as well. God, help me please to preach the spirit of this passage, the structure of this passage, and the substance of this passage. Help me to preach for the good of those who hear, but most of all, dear God, please help me to preach for your glory. In the name of Jesus, I pray this prayer. Amen. Will you turn with me in your copy of the scripture to Luke chapter... Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, I want to read in your hearing verses 10 through 17, Luke chapter 9, verses 10 through 17, it reads like this. From the New American Standard Translation of Scripture, it says, When the apostles returned, they gave an account to him of all they had done, and taking them with him, he withdrew privately to a city called Bethsaida. But the crowds were aware of this and followed him, and he welcomed them and began speaking to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who had need of healing. 
Now the day was ending, and the twelve came and said to him, Dismiss the crowd so that they may go into the surrounding villages in the countryside and find lodging and get something to eat, because here we are in a secluded place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. But they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless perhaps we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. But he said to his disciples, have them recline to eat in groups of about 50 each. They did so and had them all recline. And he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke them and gave them to the disciples again and again to serve the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied, and the broken pieces which they had left over were picked up, 12 baskets full. The grass withered, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. You may take your seat. This morning, I want to continue in our sermon series, Church in the Red, by taking this topic and tagging this sermon, The Heart of Hospitality. The Heart of Hospitality. The truth is, you can always find Jesus showing us what it means to be hospitable. This text actually tells us that Jesus is withdrawing. He's trying to get away. We don't know why he's withdrawing. Perhaps it's because, as the earlier passage says, he knows that Herod is looking for him. Or maybe it's just because Jesus is tired. Maybe he just wants to get some rest. Nevertheless, Jesus and his disciples end up going to a city called Bethsaida. And through the reading of scripture, we find that this city called Bethsaida is a place where people had witnessed miracles. It's the place where people had heard the gospel. It's the place where people understood the plan of salvation, yet they rejected it anyway. Verse 11 tells us that there is a crowd, and the crowd knows where Jesus is. The crowd knows what Jesus is up to. The crowd knows what Jesus is is doing so the Bible tells us that the crowd follows Jesus because they know his whereabouts there are a couple of things that take place one we see that Jesus does not turn the crowd away but he welcomes the crowd Jesus could have said I'm, I'm tired he he could have said, Herod is trying to hunt me down, but the Bible does, tell us, does not tell us, or the Bible simply tells us that Jesus welcomes, watch this, not one or two of them, but he welcomes the entire crowd. And I'd like to ask you a question this morning. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Are you willing to welcome the crowd? I suggest this morning that perhaps we aren't prepared to welcome the crowd, but we need to get ready because a crowd can come at any time and we have to be ready as Jesus was ready to meet their needs. Listen, help me to preach this thing. Tell your neighbor a crowd is coming and there's going to be needs that need to be met. 
Jesus, he welcomes the crowd because Jesus is the perfect picture of hospitality. He doesn't simply welcome the crowd, my brothers and sisters. The Bible tells us that Jesus begins speaking to the crowd. But anytime Jesus talks, you need to understand that the conversation is going to be what Christ wants the conversation to be. So Jesus begins to talk, and he's talking to them about the kingdom of God. Most theologians believe that in this case, when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, Jesus begins to talk about himself. Jesus begins to talk about his rule. He begins to talk about who he is because that's what the kingdom of God is all about. Let me help you understand something. The kingdom is not about me. The kingdom is not about you. The kingdom is not about St. Paul Shabbat. The kingdom is about Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus begins speaking to the crowd about what he wants to talk about. And every now and then, my brothers and sisters, we ought to show up in the crowd to hear what Jesus has to say. To, to hear what thus says the Lord. We ought to show up with the attitude that says, speak, Lord Jesus, your servants are listening. The crowd shows up and Jesus begins to speak to the crowd about what Jesus wants to speak about. When we go to Sunday school, when we go to growth group, when we come to worship, we ought to hear from Jesus. We, we ought to hear from the Lord in our singing. We ought to hear and talk to the Lord in our prayer. We ought to hear from the Lord in the preaching. You don't need to hear from me. You, you need to hear what the Lord has to say. So the crowd shows up. Jesus does not turn them away, but he speaks to them about the kingdom of God. When the last time that you've had a kingdom conversation? <laughs> when, when the last time you really sat down and, and talked about and listened to the things of God? Can I help you, dear brothers and sisters? Every single day, even all throughout the day, you need to open up your Bible and have a kingdom conversation with the king. Here's our problem. We think it's enough to talk to the king only on Sunday. That, that's, that's, that, that's the only time some of our Bibles even get cracked open. That, that's the only time that some of us pray. I need to help you. That's a good place to start. But that ain't enough. You, you need to have kingdom conversations with the king every day throughout the day. Let me help you with something else. This is for free. It's not even in my notes. When you have these conversations, you can't do all the talking. You, you need to hear what thus says the Lord, and sometimes we can't hear what thus says the Lord because we're talking too much. Jesus, he welcomes the crowd, and then he speaks to the crowd about what he wants to talk about. You, you do understand in the crowd of people, there's a lot of conversations that can take place. But when Jesus is leading the conversation, he doesn't talk about what you want to talk about. He talks about what he wants to talk about, not because what you want to talk about isn't important. It's just that what he wants to talk about is more important. But Jesus doesn't simply talk to them. The Bible tells us that Jesus makes them, he makes them whole. Uh, this means that Jesus cured them. In, in fact, that's what the text says, that, that Jesus was healing them of their diseases. 
Sometimes we're struggling with sin sickness because we won't show up and be healed of what Jesus is trying to heal us of. We, we won't be fixed, we won't be cured because we won't get in the presence of Jesus. Watch this, when the crowd showed up, they were one way, but they left a whole different way. Anytime that you and I encounter Jesus, we ought to show up one way, but we ought to leave totally different. If you don't believe me, let's ask the wise men. You remember the wise men? They went to go see uh, Jesus as an a infant, as a, a toddler, and the Bible says that when they got to him, watch this, they worshipped him and they gave him gifts, but when it was time to go, they went home a different way. Every time you come to worship, you ought to go home a different way. You ought to be different because you've met Jesus. When, when I met Jesus, I became different. I became brand new. I, I became somebody else. I became somebody I didn't recognize. And when you met Jesus, you became brand new too. You were adopted. You, you had a new name. You had a, you'd had a new father. You had a new home that you were on your way to. Jesus, according to scripture, he heals the crowd. Christ shows us a heart for hospitality. And I really want us to examine this particular text because this text will give us the tools that we need to practice hospitality in a way that is pleasing to Christ. Verse 12, hospitality, if we're going to do it in a way that pleases Christ, uh, really requires that we check our motives. The Bible tells us in chapter 12, that, or in chapter 9, verse 12, uh, that the disciples came to Jesus as he's talking with them and as he's healing the crowd. The, the Bible says that the disciples come and make a demand on Jesus. <laughs> The, the, the Bible tells us that the disciples tell Jesus, it's time for you to dismiss the crowd. <laughs> Sometimes we can make ridiculous demands on Jesus. And, and some of that is dismiss the crowd. Be, because we don't like being a crowd. We like being a congregation. We, we, we like being a church. And sometimes the problem with the congregation and the problem with the church is when the crowd shows up, they're crowding us. They're crowding our comfort. They're crowding the way that we want to do things. They're crowding the way that we've always done things. They're, they're getting in the way of what we believe we need from Jesus. I don't know if this is the disciples' attitude. I don't know if this is the posture of their heart, but the disciples does tell Jesus, you need to dismiss the crowd. And, and here's why they say that the crowd needs to be dismissed. They, they say that the crowd needs to be dismissed because um, of what they have. You, you see it. In, in verse 13, Jesus has told them, because they say dismiss the crowd so that the crowd can find their own lodging, so that the crowd can find themselves something to eat. And Jesus has told them, you give them <laughs> something to eat. <laughs> this requires the disciples to do something, because the truth of the matter is, if you are going to practice hospitality, you actually have to assess what you have. You see that in verse 13? Um, but they said to him, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. It's amazing what God can do with, with five loaves and, 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 and two, two fish. It, it's amazing what God can do with with just a little bit, if you if you simply put it 
in his hands. Here, here's the problem. We like controlling things. I, I've told you this before, but let me tell you again, a, a golf ball and a, 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 a iron is uh, just a weapon in my hand. It's just wasting time in my hand. But if you put a nine iron in Tiger Woods' hands, that's, that's five masters. If you put a basketball in my hand, I, I can probably shoot a little bit. I, I, I can probably run up and down the court at least two or three times. But if you put a ball in Michael Jordan's hands, that, that's six championship rings. What about when you put what you got in the hands of God? It's always more than what you need. So, so Jesus tells them, you give them something to eat, and when they assess what they have, they say, it's not enough. It says that there's at least three problems here. There's not enough because we really don't have enough money to feed everybody. The, the little money that we do have won't even feed us. You, you do understand that. Judas was in the disciples at this time, and he was pocketing some of the money for himself, so there was not enough for even the rest of the disciples. Sometimes there's just not enough resources to, to feed everybody. But then they also say, let me tell you what we do have. They, they said, we found a little boy. It's not in this gospel but in the other gospels they say we found a little boy with a lunch box and it has these five loaves and these two fish in it that, that's what the other gospels tell us about this particular episode and and they say even though this is what we got as you can see the crowd you know this ain't enough because there's 5,000 men, not including women and children, in the crowd. How, how are you going to feed 5,000 plus with five loaves, two fish? How are you going to do that? I'll tell you how you do it. Put it in the hands of Jesus. That, that's why the church needs to stop complaining about what we don't have. And put what we do have... In the hands of Jesus. Because Jesus can do more with our little than we can do with a lot. That they, they do what Jesus, what Jesus says to do because hospitality that pleases Jesus requires that disciples follow instructions. Uh, if the Lord said do it, This is a strange concept to Baptist folk. If the Lord said do it, you really don't have to call a meeting and vote on it. <laughs> let, let, let me help you. If the Lord says clothe the naked, you don't have to vote and pray about if you're going to clothe the naked. What, what you need to pray about is, okay, Lord, give me the resources to do what you called me to do. If the Lord says, love your neighbor, you don't have to pray about if you need to love your neighbor. You just need to love your neighbor because the Lord said so. We're always trying to vote and pray about what God already told us to do. We need a theology of Nike. Just do it. Just do what God called you to do. But here's another thing. If we're going to practice good hospitality, we got to have strategy. There's 5,000 plus people in this episode, not including the disciples and Jesus. Jesus has told his disciples you give them something to eat. And then he gives them an even more difficult task without any details. <laughs> Here's our problem. We, we want all the details. 
We, we want everything worked out before we start working it out. We want to know all the ins and outs instead of doing what Jesus just said to do. Here, here's what Jesus says. Watch this. He doesn't say, have them line up. I'm about to feed them. I, I need you to understand something. The episode that we see here is not a buffet. It's a banquet. <laughs> Je Jesus tells his rowdy disciples <laughs> that have them sit down, watch this, have them recline, watch this, don't just sit down anywhere, have them get in groups of 50. This, I, I, I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, this is something significant. These are fishermen, these tax collectors, these, these are people that are not used to this type of hospitality. Now Jesus is telling them that they have to be waiters. <laughs> he, he, he's telling them you got to tuck your shirt in. He, he, he's telling them you got to put a, a towel around your arm. And he's telling them you got to serve this crowd that you were just trying to get rid of. Well, watch this. And they don't even know what they are going to do. But the Bible tells us in verse 15, they did so and had them all reclined. That verse alone shouts me because the truth of the matter is this ought to be all of our testimony. Verse 15 of chapter 9 the testimony of the church, the testimony of God's people, the testimony of those who follow God is, and they did so. They, they, they did exactly what God said to do. Watch this. And the scripture doesn't tell us they complained about it. It's a simple sentence. They did it. <laughs> Watch this. In order for this to actually become our testimony, my testimony, and your testimony, we got to put our full weight. We got to put our full dependence on Jesus. We, we got to obey Jesus. He says, or the scripture says, and they did it. But... Hospitality requires two more things. Hospitality doesn't only require what Jesus did. Hospitality requires what we need to do. It's not just about sitting people down. It's about serving them. You, you see that in verse 16, and he took the five loaves and two fish, and then Jesus prayed over the meal and he gave it to the disciples to serve the crowd and the Bible says again and again <laughs> that that means that the whole crowd is eating what was five loaves and two fish everybody is eating and the Bible says again and again, <laughs> don't, don't miss it. You, you are missing. You are missing your shower. You making me work harder than I, I wanted to hurt work, hurt work today than I intended on working uh, today. So uh, let me just really give you uh, this this last piece right here. Um, as the disciples served, the crowd <laughs> was satisfied. <laughs> They didn't only eat. They didn't only get a taste. This wasn't walking through Sam's or Costco on a Saturday tasting all of the stuff. They had a full meal. They had more than they needed. They had everything that they needed. Watch this. This is what I like about the text. There was leftovers. <laughs> if that didn't shout you, you ain't going to shout today. That they started off with not enough, but by the time we get to the end, there's more than enough because that's who Jesus is. Jesus always provides more than 
enough. And I need to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, whatever the little you have, you always got more than enough if Jesus gave it to you. If Jesus has put his hand on it, if, if Jesus has blessed it, if, if Jesus has provided it, it's more than enough. I need to tell you something. You got more grace. You, you got more mercy. <laughs> You got more love. You got more for forgiveness because Jesus always gives more than enough. Aren't you glad that we have a Jesus who is hospitable? Aren't you glad that we have a, a Savior who always provides more than enough? Can I tell you why he, he provides more than enough? He, he provides more than enough because he's able to provide just enough. <laughs> if you don't believe me, visit Calvary with me. When he became enough for my sin and enough for your sin. Watch this, not just my sins of today and yesterday, but he died becoming my sins of tomorrow because Jesus is more than enough. And maybe there's somebody in the room today. You've been struggling. You, you've been dealing with this lack of satisfaction. You, you've tried a number of things and you can't seem to figure out what's going on. You, you've tried drugs. You've tried, you tried alcohol. You, you, you've tried sex outside of marriage outside of God's original plan. You, you tried shopping to make yourself happy and, and eating to make yourself happy. I don't want to talk to you about happiness today, to be honest with you. I want to introduce you to joy. And his name is Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Watch this. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. If there's a void in your life, I'm going to ask today that you would try Jesus. That you would make Jesus Savior and Lord of your life. Let me ask you this question you were to die today, if you were to take your last breath, are you certain of where you would spend eternity? Let me help you with something. You don't get to go to heaven and spend eternity with the Father because you've been baptized. Yeah, we want you to be baptized, but you got to believe. I don't want you to think that you can spend eternity with the Father because all of the wrong that's being done, you don't participate in any of that. That's good. Keep up the good work. But your goodness does not get you into heaven. Only Jesus can do that. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here and you're in this room today and you don't know Jesus in a personal way you're not, you're not certain of your salvation if that's you do me a favor and raise your hand one of our commitment coaches will come to you where you're at they'll show you from the scripture how you can you can be saved 
today. If everybody here is saved while your head is still bowed, to do me a favor, you're sure that you're going to spend eternity with the Father, you're walking with Christ right now, if you do me a favor and just raise your hand, those of you who are walking with Christ, those of you who are sure of your salvation, do me a favor, raise your hand now. If you, if you see somebody sitting next to you that can't raise their hand, hands are still raised. If you see somebody whose hand is not raised, I need you to be a witness to them. I need you to tell them that they, that they can be saved right here, right now. Praise God. Every head is raised. Let me ask you this. Maybe you're here and you don't have a church home. church to be a part of. This is a good church to make your home. This is a church where, where the people are going to love you. This is a church where we get to have fun together. And this is a church where we are growing together. Where you can be yourself and still become more like Christ. Now, ain't that good? That you can come and you can dress how you want to dress. You can be as comfortable as you want to be and still be like Jesus. You can vote how you want to vote and still be like Jesus. So if you're here today and you don't have a church home, give us a try. Give us a try. We'll take you in right now if you're here. As a matter of fact, do me a favor. With whoever you're sitting next to, do me a favor. Ask them two questions. Ask them, do you need a church home? And if they say no, Tell them this, let me help you to make this your church home. To tell them welcome to the family. Can y'all do that? Talk to your neighbor. If they don't have a church home, let's go ahead and tell them. Welcome to the family. So Father God, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for, for this time. We thank you for your word. God, my, my hope that this was clear and convicting, my hope that, that this was a message of hope, that we would know how to uh, model hospitality, that we would be welcoming to others just as you, Lord, have been welcoming us. In the name of Jesus, we pray this prayer. Amen. Amen. Don't y'all ever say Pastor you preach too long at least don't say it today we're going to give ourselves to the offering are we what are we doing are we marching around or are we what are we doing? We're marching around. All right. Let me let me read this in your hearing. I was I was thinking about y'all can come. I was thinking and just just wrestling with uh, the fact that I I really believe that the local church 
should have a giving affirmation or an offering affirmation. And I've been writing offering affirmations and orisons and trying to come up with stuff. And the Holy Spirit slapped me upside the head and said, you don't need to come up with anything that's already been given to you. So I, I want to read what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 to help us to start understanding our giving. And, and starting the first Sunday in May, when it's offering time, we'll have this on the screens and we're going to recite this as our offering affirmation as we give. Listen to what the words of the Apostle Paul says. He says, so I considered it necessary to urge the brothers that they go on ahead to you, of you and arrange in advance your previously promised generous gift. That the same would be ready as a generous gift and not as one grudgingly given due to greediness. Now I say this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the one who sows generously will also reap generously. Each one must do just as he has decided in his heart. Let me teach for a moment. That means don't ever let anybody manipulate you into giving. Give what God has given you to give. Listen to this. Each must do just as he has decided in his own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace overflow to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed as it is written, he scattered abroad. He gave to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but it is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof given to this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. While they also, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because you because of your surpassing grace of God in you. Listen to this. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Amen. This is why we give and this is how we give. With everybody standing, if you're giving, do me a favor, just come from wherever you are as you return back to your seat, we'll give ourselves to the final benediction after I make one announcement. to bless these gifts and the givers. I ask that you would multiply it. Help us to steward it wisely for the good of this body, but most of all for your glory. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Before we give ourselves to the final benediction, 
listen, in about five minutes, I'm asking everybody if don't leave if you don't have to. We're going to have our congregational conversation uh, in about five minutes. Uh, get get your children, bring them back to the sanctuary, and we'll spend about an hour together at the most. We'll be done at 11:45 or so. So I'm just asking. Uh, that you would please stay with me uh, so that we can have our congregational conversation uh, here right after worship. I want to share some uh, statistics with you, some things that are going on in the life of this church, and then I want to show you a model of a pathway forward. Everybody standing for the benediction. Take a five-minute break, and we'll be back. Scripture says this, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And the people of God together said, amen, amen. I'll be back in five minutes.